everybody. I have Jenny Schottmiller here with me today. She is an accountant turned, were you an accountant and then a therapist or a therapist and then an accountant? Accountant, sure. therapist, and then therapist accountant. Gotcha. Okay. And she has an awesome Facebook group and tons of courses that help people with the accounting and business side of being a therapist. So I asked her to come in today and just share like the top five questions she gets about accounting. And she was really excited to do it. So I'm so glad you're here. I really appreciate it. I know the group is really going to benefit from it. And I will turn it over to you as the top five, right? Or did you say top you had five. one extra so bonus? Actually, so in preparation for this, I was figuring out, because I get a lot of questions. I'm like, okay, so what are my top five questions? And let me look, and I'm writing them down. I'm like, oh, well, that adds up to six. So let's just do six. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. I'm just going to mind that, right? Even better. <laughs> Even better. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, okay. So there's a couple things. Um, first I wanted to just clarify. So I, I was an accountant and then I um, had the fortune to be able to switch careers and become a therapist. And I love being a therapist. Um, and then when I became, um, when I entered into private practices, when I started meeting other therapists and realizing that they really struggle in the areas of accounting because their accountants don't necessarily treat them like collaborative business partners. And so then they have questions and they try to get their questions answered. And I'm like, I didn't understand what that answer said. Like, you know, yeah, I can relate. <laughs> and I know as a clinician, you know, my informed consent says I have a conformed consent and a bill of rights. And it says you have a right to have clinical language, clinical issues explained to you in plain language. If I talk clinical, Absolutely. you are not going to feel empowered by what I'm saying. Right. Accounts don't necessarily have that same mindset, but it's the same principle. You are a client of uh, the accountant. You deserve to have the accounting topics explained in plain language. So I see myself as filling in the gap between business owners and their accountants that might not take the time to educate them, but business owners who really need the education. But I don't do anything with insurance. So, you know, stay at this group is the is the source for insurance information. And I but I do sort of accounting and financial and paying yourself stuff. So Perfect. one other caveat I want to just start off with because of everything that's happening right now. We started off in March having this pandemic that put us into a place of we've never been here before. We don't know what is gonna happen, and our practices are very often very impacted by it. Yeah. And then George Floyd got murdered. And oh. the events that have unfolded since are um, so important to be uh, mindful of. And it was brought to my attention, and I'm just doing my best to be listening, yeah. is that it feels very in, um, dismissive to be going about business as usual. Mm -hmm. So just know that in my personal life and in my, lit, my, um, my profession as a clinician, I am absolutely not business as usual. Not that it matters about me, but I just think it's important to know that I can be talking about accounting and also know that there is a lot going on that is way, way more important than accounting. And that just because I'm talking about it doesn't mean I think it's the most important thing. Absolutely. But for people who do need to know some of these answers, here, here are some answers to some of the top five, five six questions. And if you are right now overwhelmed, stressed, upset, in pain, hurt, mark this for later. Come yeah. back at a point in which you are ready to focus on some aspects of your business because it will come back up again and it won't go away, but when it feels like it's the right time for you to do that. Absolutely. So Thank I you just for saying want, that. You know, want to acknowledge that. All right, so top five questions that um, I get. So one of the, uh, the one that I want to, I know comes up a lot that I want to address, um, especially because for people who take insurance, there is a difference often between your rate and what you get paid. I get and this one we all the time. Call it a, we call it a contracted rate because it's the rate per contract, not our rate. And in the mental health, in the health field, like step out of mental health for a second, in the health field, this is so common. If you went and looked at the accounting of a hospital, they have a rate for a room for a night that is a standard rate. Mm -hmm. 
every insurance pays a different amount for that room for a night and they all have a contracted rate. So what do we do with that? So I'm just going to use the example I think that was brought up recently where your, your rate is 150 and you have an insurance right. company who pays you 100. And if you use an EHR and in your EHR, it says 150 because you've put your rate into your EHR, but your EHR knows what Cigna paid you and right. it's 100. So then you have a $50 balance. Can't bill the client. It's, 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 you don't get that money. Right. And so it is called in the EHR a write-off. And there should be an indicator somewhere in any EHR to click to write off the remaining balance. But then the question is, do I write off all my taxes? Right. The answer is no, because you'll never have recorded your standard rate on your taxes. Mm. EHR, okay. not an accounting system. It has sometimes, it has revenue information, but that's not an accounting system. An accounting system is, is a system of recording transactions that is supported by your bank transactions. So you never need to link an EHR to your accounting system. You have things that happen clinically that result in deposits and expenditures in your bank. Right. Your accounting system links just to your bank. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the example, $150 rate, $100 is what get paid. And now you know in your EHR, you're gonna write a 50, but what happens from there? Yeah. In your bank, you're gonna deposit 100 because that right. bank payment and plus the copay, whatever you get, $100 ends up being deposited. And when it gets deposited, $100 goes on your revenue line. Right. So now, your EHR says $100, I had 150, I wrote a 50, I have $100. Your accounting system starts off at $100. So there's nothing to write off for taxes, it matches. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. nice if your EHR can reconcile to your accounting system so that you can feel like your EHR information is reliable. And if you write off the balances in EHR, it should match. Gotcha, oh, that's good to know. Yeah, because I yeah. always see that little write off piece there and I'm like, I don't know. I guess I just leave it there and do nothing with it and just ignore it. Basically, we can, what I do with it. And we can think of it as like an EHR write-off or yeah. something like that. Just think about what's the end result. The end result is I got $100 and my accounting system shows $100 in revenue. And if they match, I'm done. I'm perfect. That's right. great. Yeah. And oh, good. Just another way to think about it, because um, it can be a confusing topic, is to think I'm going to pay taxes on every dollar I collect and I'm going to get deduct to deduct business expenses, but if I didn't earn it and I didn't get it, even if I earned it and someone never paid me, I didn't collect it, I don't pay taxes on it. So there's nothing to write off. My taxes are zero. I had a right. session with someone. I didn't verify their insurance. They're not really covered. It expired a month ago. They're not going to pay me. They're not coming back. I lost $150 or $100. And I earn zero. My tax right. burden for that session is zero. It doesn't get to go below zero. Gotcha. Yeah, I get that question all the time too. Yeah, yeah it's, okay, it's, thank you. It's a confusing topic when we have two systems and write-off has two meanings. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. So, okay, so let's do the next one. Okay. Um, the next one is, so should I have a separate business account? And the pandemic has highlighted the need to have a business account rather than just a separate personal account. Mm -hmm. But this question, I'm going I'm to um, start off by answering um, as explaining a form of business. So there's basically five forms of business. You can be a sole proprietor. So you just start a business without having an entity. You can have a uh, single member LLC. So you're a solo person with an LLC. You can have a partnership with someone else and you can have an entity tax as an S corp and you can have a C corp. Mm -hmm. If you're a sole proprietor, your money is your business money, your business money is your money. You definitely want there to be separation. Okay. So you definitely want to have a separate account for all of your business activities. You do not want to be audited. You don't have your business audited and they show up and they're looking at a bank statement of what you bought at Target and your groceries and your hair products <laughs> and all of that stuff. Because the auditor is going to have to be like, well, I have to now make sure that you didn't deduct all this other stuff and they're going to be way more in your business than you want them to be. Gotcha. So it's Good separate. point. Mm -hmm. There's no legal separate. 
separation between your business money and your personal money. So if you really did want to have a separate account that was personal account, fine. As long as we don't have another pandemic, because obviously we have learned through this that if you want to get a government loan, they're going to want you to have a business account. So might as well, and the banks would rather you have a business account anyway, and you can find a free business account at a credit union, at a small local bank, at a big bank, if that's where you're already doing your personal banking, you can find free and low cost business account and consider it as a deduction. It's a business expense, just like all the other things that we have to do to set up our practice. So a business account is a good idea. And having multiple business accounts can be really useful if you want to separate out savings Mm -hmm. or okay. money set aside for upcoming large expenses. Like I, I, you know, I have annual, I pay my malpractice annually. Right. I like to have a little bit of extra money set aside when I get that bill. Just, it makes it a little bit, life a little bit easier. I don't yeah. have to give pay myself less that month because I had a big bill you know, right. inside every month. So you can have multiple accounts, but definitely have them be separate. And then if you are an LLC or any other entity has to be a business account, you want your entity okay. to own the account. You want your gotcha. entity EIN on that account because there's really no point in saying I have this legally separate entity. And if I default on any debts, they can't come after me personally, but guess what? All the money's in my name, right? <laughs> So it's absolutely it's really important to have a separate business account. Do you recommend a certain, like, what do you think is the best thing for a therapist or is it just on an individualized basis? Oh, Which, for the form of business? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a bias here and my bias is against people that tell people what they should do. Okay. Good so, point. <laughs> because what I wish that my dream would be. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have a lot of dreams and obviously again what's happening in the world is right really important than accounting but i wish when people went to their accountant and said tell me about form of business options and what i need to be thinking about that they got just the straight facts the pros and the cons and then were told in an empowering way <laughs> not in a dismissive and i know what's better for your business than you right way that um here, you should be an escort. You should be an escort. And you know what? If you're not an escort, you're not being a good business person. How right. empowering is it, especially if you are from a gender standpoint or non-gender standpoint or a racial standpoint, someone who gets dismissed and mistreated in your life yeah. to have an accountant tell you what you should do as if they're an expert and um, you know, they are an expert in certain things, but they are not an expert in your life, your business, your goals, or your mission. That is such a great point. So I think the main thing is find out what the different um, forms of business give you in terms of simplicity or complexity okay. and in terms of protection and pick the one that fits with you. My sole, my um, private practice is a sole proprietorship because okay. I don't intend to be a group. I don't have employees. I don't feel like I ha need any legal protection um, for my debts, which is all LLC gives you. And it's simple. And that's what I wanted. Okay. My profit business is an LLC because I wanted to differentiate it from my private practice. And it seemed to me an LLC is not very hard to set up. It's taxed exactly the same as a sole proprietor. So I formed an LLC. Mm -hmm. Some people want to form a S Corp because, for example, if you're in California, you can't be an LLC. So an S Corp is your next best option to get any legal oh. protection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And some people want to form an LLC because it has a different type, a different way of taxing you, which might be advantageous. It also might not be advantageous. So you have to look at what it will actually do to your taxes to that, make that decision. Hmm. But okay. That, that's great. That's sort of a, also a good common question related to, to form of business. Um, so hopefully that answers it. And you know what, if anyone has yeah. questions after, I'm sure that they could just post in the comments and tag me and I will be happy to answer any additional questions about form of business. Thank you. Yeah. So one of the other things that I think is really important, um, with, especially with sort of the move to telehealth right now mm -hmm. is, um, do I need to pay, will I have to pay taxes in multiple states? Oh, yes. This is such and a good one. It's so hard to answer that <sighs> question. One of the hardest questions when someone has a really good question, you're like, well, it depends. And then they're like, that didn't help me at all. <laughs> no. 
These are nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you how to go about finding out. Okay, because, that's excellent. You know, now that you know, if if depending on what happens with the insurance, I, there is a huge push I think in this country to continue to allow therapists to see people across state borders, especially if they tra are traveling. And then what does that mean if you end up with a bunch of clients in another state? Or if you move, we now, who doesn't have a telehealth platform right now? Right. So if you move to another state, why wouldn't you just keep seeing some clients in that state and have that extra income, right? Yeah, absolutely. So what it comes down to is the state laws in the states that you operate. Okay. Unlike therapy where we have to be licensed in a state and we're limited on whether we can practice in other states, accountants, CPAs, and EAs, which is an enrolled agent from the IRS, both perfectly well-qualified tax preparers, can file state taxes in every single state and territory and even internationally. Mm, so okay. they're not limited if by their location okay. and often are trained and skilled and they're have tax software that, that will cover all the states. So, but if you are in one particular state is your home base or where the majority of your revenue is, you want to ask yourself, well, which the states that I'm in, do they have state tax? And where is the most state tax going to be? I want to have an accountant in that state. Hmm. Where okay. you live, if that's where your majority of clients are, or if you've recently moved in, most of your clients are in your former state, I would keep an accountant in the former state. If you have two states you operate in and one has no state taxes, no state income tax, or you mm -hmm. know, maybe it's property or uh, sales tax, usually some states don't, but there's no income tax, meaning there's no income tax filing in your end. Who cares if you have an accountant in your state? Get one in. Right. right. Like in Ala operating in Alaska and California, Alaska has no state tax. California and New York have the most complicated state taxes that we have in the, U in the United States. Pick someone in the very complicated state such a good that. tip yes yeah because you're going to basically need to answer this question for yourself you're going to be like do i need to pay taxes in multiple states and you're going to want to get a professional who knows their stuff and mm -hmm. start with someone who is um, located where you're going to have the biggest impact and then ask them to explain it to you and if they don't do that find someone else okay they yeah can't take 15 minutes to say well the law in this state says this and this is how it is. And then here in this other state, if you see any clients, you're going to need to pay taxes there because that's where the services was rendered. Great. I run a private practice. I can totally understand that. Right. <laughs> you don't need to talk down to me. If they don't ever talk to you, just walk out. So right. <laughs> I don't need you. You know, right. I think it's a good idea to have an accountant if you're a business person. Because mm -hmm. even if it's simple and small and you know you can do TurboTax, at some point, consider getting an accountant. Even if you've yeah. done TurboTax for 10 years, still at some point, you might want to consider getting an accountant. So if you can't find someone, then just do your, don't do your own taxes if you're an escort. But if you have simple taxes, don't stand for anybody saying, oh, well, you won't be able to understand that. So I'm just not going to explain it to you. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah that would be out. terrible. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a good analogy is that when you, when you go to talk to a lawyer about business related legal matters, you want to walk, you're not walking out of there knowing how to be an attorney, but you definitely want to know, walk out of there knowing what legal issues right. pertain to your business because you're the one doing the daily operations and you need to know where you're, where you're going to get into trouble. Yeah. You want to leave your accountant's office having learned something about taxes and accounting too. Such right. a good tip. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so multiple states, separate business account. And then um, how do I pay myself? Probably one of the biggest, most common questions I have. And this really goes to what, what an individual's money mindset, money story, past experience is. Because some people right away like well yeah I know how to pay myself or something like I don't want to overpay myself I don't want to underpay myself is it really my money mm -hmm. oh yeah can I take yeah. it out of my business you know if, 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 if your only experience ever has been someone giving you a paycheck right how much do I determine is my pay so here again it goes to your form of business if you're okay. a sole proprietor or an LLC or partnership, you determine for yourself 
what you can pay yourself and you just pay yourself. You just okay. take out. If you like to have a structured pay, if you've been used to getting paid on the 1st and 15th and you like that, it fits with when your bills are due, mm -hmm. pay yourself on the 1st and 15th. If you are in a situation where you have a partner and you don't rely on your, on your private practice income, pay yourself once a month. Yeah. It, <laughs> yourself every Friday, do that. Have some kind of organization to it, but be okay. flexible enough and ask yourself, what fits for me? And it, it actually mm -hmm. is that simple. You can actually just transfer the money to yourself. That's all you have to do. Perfect. Yep. If you are a corporation, you are required to treat yourself as an employee and have a salary and run payroll and pay payroll tax. And in that case, you still get to pick the frequency. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Weekly, weekly, twice a month, once a month. And you still get to pick the amount. But if you're a corporation, you're expected to pay yourself commensurate with your work. So you're supposed okay. to look at and say, what is reasonable? And this gets to be a difficult topic for people, but it's really not that difficult. When they say reasonable, we tend to think, well, wait, they're the IRS. So I already expect them to be unreasonable. <laughs> so I don't really know what reasonable to them would be. Right. But mm. you just need to ask yourself what's reasonable for me. If, in, if before I started my private practice, I was making $60,000 a year, and now my private practice is netting one hundred and twenty. dollars Paying myself 30 doesn't really seem reasonable. Right. <laughs> How did I earn 20 if I really, my work only was valued at 30? Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it's important from the standpoint that your salary is going to be taxed differently when you're a corporation than it will be taxed if you're an entity. When you are a sole proprietor or an LLC, all your money is taxed exactly the same. So take it out whenever you want, however much you want. It doesn't make a difference for your taxes. If you're a corporation, your salary dictates how much payroll tax, how much Medicare and Social Security tax you're paying. The government actually does care about that. Right. You yeah. not want to see corporate officers underpaying Medicare and Social Security tax. And they pay attention because their computers can calculate what your salary was versus your total earnings versus the average of other people in your field. And that's oh. mm -hmm. what often get chosen for audits. The computer says, this doesn't really look like all the other businesses in this industry look like. All our taxes have a code. We say what industry we're in. Right. And we use that code to compare our taxes to other similar businesses. And if something works out really wacky, um, then, you know, if, if let's say you have the home office deduction and you put on there that you use 10% of your home. Right. Or, um, or let's say your, your home office do something wacky. You're, Home office deduction says you use 80% of your home for your private practice. And every single other person taking the home office deduction says somewhere between 20 and 15%. Right. It's a red flag. You're out of whack. It wasn't reasonable. And it right. Really and sometimes people approach taxes as, what can I get away with? No. <laughs> what is reasonable? And guess what? You won't ever probably get into any trouble ever if you do it that way. That's so, a great tip. Be reasonable for, for a corporation is what is the value of your services actually really, really, really? If you were telling your sister or your colleague, your friend, your partner, what your services are worth, then it should be, you can have a profit component to what you mm -hmm. earn, but you need to value your services appropriately. So yeah. that's how to pay yourself and you'll do salary. Now, if you're a corp, you do the salary, you'll still have that profit piece. And that profit piece is, is, is like a sole proprietor. Take it out whenever you want. Quarterly bonus, right. monthly bonus, weekly take it out. You do want to leave enough in your business to cover the upcoming bills. Mm -hmm. Right. In this pandemic, I believe after the pandemic is over, we are all going to have a little bit of a different mindset towards savings. Yeah, seriously. We didn't really have, you know, we're like, okay, yeah, sure. It's good to save two to three months worth of expenses. That's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we had, on especially such a global basis, needing two to three months of expenses I to know. be in the bank. And not that we think another pandemic is going to happen anytime soon, but we don't know. Right. And we don't, we also, you can have a sick relative. You can get sick yourself. You know, what if you have a, parent who gets cancer and you want to take off two months to go take care of them if you have the if you have two to three four months in the bank of expenses mm -hmm. 
you're going to be able to do that. And, you know, if you live in a place where there are often natural disasters in the part of the country that has those, you, you know that, right? And so right. We, all, we all can take that approach now. So one way to approach it, I, I look at what money do I have in the bank? What okay. do I want to pay myself? What do I need? Mm -hmm. What do I need to leave in the business? And then you're going to have your answer right there. That's perfect. Yep. That's great. Right. So what, how to pay myself, how to estimate taxes. Okay. <laughs> so, can I tell you everything you need to know in like 15 minutes about how to estimate taxes? Okay. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about the concept of estimating taxes and demystify it. I decided a while ago that even though I can explain a lot of things really simply in a short period of time, sometimes even a Facebook comment and make things clear, mm -hmm. estimated taxes is one of those things that is simple and not too hard to understand. It is absolutely not rocket science. It is not brain surgery. Any person who's running a business can understand estimated taxes. Mm -hmm. There's just a little more to it and it's a little more involved than I can just explain really quickly. Okay. But the, the idea here is that when you have a paycheck, and again, if you're an S corp, you have a paycheck, right? then money comes out every month and doesn't even really bother us. We just look at the net amount. We ignore the gross and we don't really actually get too troubled by it. Right. But when you have either for a corporation, that profit piece, that portion above your salary, or for a sole proprietor L LLC or partnership, nobody's paying your taxes. Mm -hmm. And you can either be proactive or you can be reactive. And you can also either care about overpaying or underpaying. Some people mm -hmm. get up. Uh, to the end of the tax year, and anyone watching this is going to know where they fall when I say this. Like it's <laughs> instinctive, sort of like, you know, there, there are different, um, you know, personality types or temperaments or levels of sensitivity. This, you, you will fall on the spectrum of this one way or the other. And some people mm -hmm. get to be in the they oh, they're like, bummed. Oh, I, oh, I wanted a <laughs> refund. My <laughs> refund's like my bonus. Right. You know, I get to, I get to trip with my refund where that's what I do house repairs with. And if I don't have that refund, it feels like a loss. Right. And some people get to the end and they get a big refund and like, Oh, the government kept my money all year. They didn't need it. <laughs> I wish I had had it. I'd rather I could have been spending this. Yeah. I could have been <laughs> using that money all year. And, and, and I don't want to have a big bonus. So, um, you, you, you know, wherever you fall on that spectrum is going to tell you whether or not you want to, shoot because an estimate is an estimate it's right. just you're guessing right. you don't know that especially for for 2020 yeah <laughs> so messed up this year no kidding i mean if you get a good accountant find out their favorite food and give them something at tax time when they're doing your 2020 taxes okay <laughs> because it is going to be nightmarish for the uh -oh. tax professionals given there are so many brand new rules that are coming out that they're going to have to learn and follow. It's mm -hmm. going to be challenging, Wow! but it's an estimate. So decide whether you feel like you want to shoot high or shoot low. Okay. And if you want to get a refund, shoot high. Over okay. Estimate. Come up with an estimate and then bump it up a little bit. So you get a refund. And if you want to not get a refund, shoot low, but okay. not so low that you're going to pay a penalty. And not so low that you're going to be in a bad financial position. So I, I think yeah. it's a good idea. If you're one is going to shoot low, so you get a, um, you don't get a refund. So you will pay at your end, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Six extra money in a savings account. Okay. Because if you do owe at your end, and if you're conservative and you're like, the last thing I need after the year I've had is a tax bill. Even if you're overestimating, still stick a little money in a savings account. Because <laughs> if the tax person says to you, you owe $2,000 and you have three in the bank. Right. Fine. <laughs> okay. Not a big deal. I can you have nothing. <laughs> the last thing any of us are going to need to have next, December, next February or March is a blow. Right. <laughs> to us financially. So no it's always, you can always just save a little bit. And if you end up not needing it, then you can get a cool training. <laughs> exactly. You reward yourself one way or the other. Right. So, um, so estimated taxes, just the general idea here is that you need to learn how 
to read your taxes. Okay. And I now, I, my analogy for this is an assessment, right? So I'm a master's level clinician. I'm an LMFT, but I took an assessment class in, in, in my master's program because they said, even though you're not in my, in my state, master's level clinicians aren't, can't do assessments. The psychologists mm -hmm. can do assessments. They said, you're going to read them. Oh. You're going to have clients that have assessments and you're mm -hmm. going to want to know enough to be able to read the reports. Mm -hmm. So even though none of us, other than maybe me, are going to be tax professionals and you don't need to know enough to do taxes, you do need to know enough to read them and they are readable. Right. So right. Not tax return. And if, and you're, um, if you file as a self-employed person, a schedule C are completely readable and understandable. They have okay. information such as the total income you earned, mm -hmm. your income after they've adjusted it for standard and other deductions your total tax that you owe for the whole year. And then when we have a refund or we get money back, the only difference is we got to the end of the year, the tax form said you owe X dollars and you right. paid in X dollars. And this is simple math. If you paid in enough, if you paid in too much, you get money back. And if you didn't pay in enough, you owe. Your refund or payment at the end of the year is not your taxes. Right. Your taxes is the total of the whole year that you owe, plus or minus any extra you have to pay or get back at your end. And that number is on your tax return. So when you can read your taxes, you can have a sense. Because oftentimes in Facebook especially, people will say, save 30%, save 15%. Yeah, right. Well, guess what? If you're in California, you might be paying 40% in taxes. And if you're in Alaska, maybe you're paying 10. Wow. Here right. Comes really high and you have a partner that you file married filing jointly and they have a high income your tax bracket is not going to be the same as the other person at the networking event with you who might be single and have just started their private practice right absolutely mm -hmm. so don't Great. assume it's the same know how to know where you fall and okay. then know that last year's taxes don't mean that this year's taxes is going to be the same yeah. You can give yourself a room for saying, hmm, I think I'm going to make more this year. Hmm, I gave up my full-time job and my practice kind of, I'm actually going to make less. So it's an estimate. And, and I do, um, I do do training on helping people understand how to go through this process to come up That's with an estimate, great. but just to know that it's a process of saying, this is what I want. Here's where my values are. Here's where I fell last year. Here's mm -hmm. where my practice Here's where I'm going to ballpark myself for this year. And after you do that, that's the hard part. Paying your estimated taxes is super easy. First and quarter, first and second quarter estimated taxes. So your estimated taxes for any income you earn between January and June of 2020 are mm -hmm. due on July. Okay, right. Next estimate on September 15th. And then our last estimate for the year through December will be January 15th, barring any other changes that come out. Right. Um, you know, when you're watching this, there's just a little bit of, there's, a, there's enough time left to do an estimate before July 15th taxes are, um, or if you're watching this later down the road and it's past July 15th, then September's your next one in January. And it's a really good idea. So some people will tell, you know, you know, a lot of people give advice when they don't necessarily know. And so they're like, yeah. yeah, yes, you do. <laughs> the government really does want you to pay taxes as you go because they know what happens. If someone gets to the end of the year and they didn't pay any taxes, they are not going to necessarily afford to pay 12 months worth of taxes all at once. No kidding. On an installment plan paying this year's taxes next year where you're also paying next year's taxes at the same time and it's too much. So be proactive, pay your taxes. There are penalties if you weigh underpay, but not if you underpay a little bit. Yeah. So, wow. That's great really tip. pretty small so some people don't even care about their penalties but penalties tend to be small but still it's a good idea to just it's just a good business practice to pay them mm -hmm. okay so okay. let's see. we had separate business account contracted rate multiple states um estimated and payments. okay so the last one number six is what is an accounting system and do i really need one? Oh, great one great question <laughs> And, and I think what's important here is like any, um, any clinician has to know something about systems. 
Mm-hmm. You know, whether you, even, whether you practice as a family therapist, see couples, or do internal family systems work, every one of us is part of a system. Every client is part of a system. So we know that sy- sy- human systems are very complex and messy, and counting systems just aren't. <laughs> proactive and you know it. Yeah. as an account but it's true it I know. seems like the counting systems are hard yeah but i really really want people to know if you can understand how to help a depressed or anxious or traumatized person or family navigate the emotional uh the thinking and the behavioral um issues that they have to deal with you can understand accounting. Yeah. Accounting as its base is simply a record of what has happened in your business. Mm-hmm. That's it. You got money, you paid money, you categorize things, certain things are deductible, certain things are not. And once you learn that, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, how did I get it? Okay, all right, it's good. So what is an accounting system? An accounting system okay. is simply something that tracks your results of your business, your income and your expenses. It's just a Mm -hmm. tracking system. We could call it tracking system. Mm -hmm. It can be as simple as a spreadsheet you created yourself or purchased. It can be a very complex, full-blown accounting system. The only thing I think that's important about um, having a full-blown accounting system is that if you're going to grow into a group or you're going to, um, you know, grow over time, it's a good idea to have a, a professional software Mm -hmm. nice reports and if you have any of the pandemic relief like the yeah if you have the eid alone you have to uh, submit accounting statements oh okay accounting systems to give your tax person at your end so you can create the accounting systems in a spreadsheet so Mm -hmm. it's like a tracking system that does some reporting and um yes you need one Everyone needs some type of accounting because otherwise what happens is you get to do your taxes and your tax accountant asks you questions or TurboTax asks you questions and you're like, hmm, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> right. And the accounting system allows you to know. And it is just as important that the taxes are paid appropriately as you as the business owner know what the heck happened in your business. Mm-hmm. If you're not regularly looking at the results of your business, then you don't really know. You are guessing. And while we want to guess about our estimated taxes, we do not want to guess about what actually happened in your business. Right. Was last month your worst month ever? Was last month better than you thought? You don't know if you're actually looking. So we, we want to overcome any kind of avoidance that we might have and say, you know what? I saw those clients. I collected that revenue. I paid those bills. It cannot be that scary to look at my accounting. Yeah. If I learn how to process, how to read it, if I get some support if I need it, and get to the point where I have um, increased my capacity to look at my numbers. Mm-hmm. And it, obviously people get overwhelmed. Oh, and they, sure. they, nobody chooses to be overwhelmed. It happens to you. And then it is really hard to process the information. So then that's a great, if that's happening to you, that's a great time to have a really good accountant or talk to me and we will get you to the point where you are comfortable and you don't get overwhelmed when you look at your numbers. Either way, got to look at your numbers. That's great. So you do that, you offer that service to help people get an accounting system set up if they want that? Absolutely. That's yes. fantastic. And, yeah. and just because what I've seen and, and is, is that if people get um, an hour or two or three of training in how to do a, their own accounting, even if they use a bookkeeper, I think even if you use a bookkeeper, it is really important to know how it works because you are overseeing that bookkeeper's work. Right. And if you don't know what the output should look like or how it actually works, you don't know if they're charging you appropriately and mm-hmm. you don't know if they did a good job. Right. And so bookkeeping true. itself is not a complex tax. I'm not asking anyone to learn how to do their taxes. Right. But bookkeeping itself is, is simply keeping track. Yeah, I have a fantastic accountant. She sat down with me and taught me QuickBooks and how to put everything in. So, you know, I'm so glad I know how to do that stuff now. Yeah, and some people hate QuickBooks. And um, it's, it's not the, it's, it's, it, it's more likely that you hate it if you didn't get any training on it. Yeah, sure. I could see that. Walks you through it. It's like, okay, 
all right, so I do this and I do this and I do this and then I can see what I made and everything is good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was really glad to have that training. It makes sense to me now. And I could just say like, well, how much did I make that month? Or I took six vacations last year. You know, what's the difference with eight, you know, eight weeks of vacation or six weeks, you know, it helps you calculate that stuff. Absolutely. And, and it also helps with planning because when you can see what happened, you might say, you know what, gosh, every July for the last three years has been my lowest month ever. I think July is my new vacation month. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know? um, or July is the month where I want to do more advertising because I don't want, because I don't want it. I always take my vacations in August and I want July to be better. I don't want to go into my vacation month with the lowest revenue of the year anymore. Right. So that's the kind Great of thing point. When, you can, when you really look at your, at your information. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. These are, this has just been great. I think it's going to help people so much. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think, um, you know, even especially when there is such a, such a difficult time, um, yeah. people of color, but just, just from the pandemic, from people getting sick, people have lost loved ones. Okay. There's so much stress that if, you know, if we can make some of this be simple, so that they don't have to stress, worry, or spend exorbitant amount of time handling it, yeah. then, then I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. So where can people find you if they want to look you up and, and get your services and your courses and your Facebook group and all that stuff? Yeah, so the, the best place to find me would probably be my Facebook group, Simple Profit for Mental Health Clinicians. Okay. And also my website. So I have a lot of resources on my website. I have a blog that talks about accounting and tax topics that there's a lot of articles out there. And my blog has like, people read my blog, like, wow, there's so much information here. Well, all that information is free on the internet anyway. I just like the way I explain it. I like it too. I've been reading them. <laughs> I try to be thorough and clear. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my approach to my blog. And I find that when I read other people's articles, sometimes they're inaccurate, which just drives me bonkers. Yeah. And sometimes they're just like, they leave these holes. Like, no, I want to walk away knowing what to do. So my blog yeah. is free information, but it's explained better than other people. I think, I don't know if that sounds conceited. No, no, I think it's wonderful. Read What's my your website? That's for yourself. If that yeah. is true. And yeah, <laughs> uh, the other thing that's really important on my, um, on my webpage is I have a start page for if you are starting your private practice and people think maybe, you know, in a pandemic isn't the time to start a private practice, but telehealth has really, I think, opened the door. I'm sitting in my house. This is my office. Yeah. And so why wouldn't I just put up my ad and have a private practice if I don't already? Mm -hmm. And one of the wonderful things about a private practice is that you can start it while maintaining your other income stream that you had before. If you had a job, if you work for a group, you can yeah. start it anytime. So I have a page that goes through like the top 10 things you need to do to start private practice on the business side, things that other people aren't going to oh, tell. Awesome. Me. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I have courses that you can also look at and take um, on there as well. Oh, that's great. And what was your website? So, oh, simpleprofit.com. Okay. And you also can reach me at Jenny at simpleprofit.com. Oh, Jenny, perfect. Jenny, uh, Facebook group. If you, it, you're looking for me, you'll find me, I'm sure. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.